Welcome to Equitable Minds, a monthly podcast focusing on pertinent issues in the U.S. educational system and our society today. We bring to attention concerns in areas such as educational leadership, school and community, innovation in education, research to practice, and social and cultural challenges in schools. We invite experts, educators, and community members to discuss challenges and present solutions. I'm your host, Dr. Floyd Beachman, been a professor of urban school leadership at Lehigh University. Welcome to another episode of Equitable Minds. I'm your host, Dr. Floyd Beecham. And as always, my co-host, Yalitza, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, everybody. Nice to see everyone again. All right, folks. I know it's been a while. We were off for the summer. We are back again. We are back full steam ahead this time here in the fall. And folks, uh, all our listeners, all our viewers out there, we have a treat for you today. Back by popular demand is Dr. Festus Obiakor, once Woo! again, joining the show. And in case you did not see the first one, go back into the archives and see the first show. Uh, one of our most popular episodes starred Dr. Obiakor and a host of uh, his family members, friends. Uh, it was just a whole community event. We got Dr. Obiakor back once again today. So in case you don't know who Dr. Obiakor is, let me just briefly uh, uh, explain some things for you here. Um, Dr. Obiakor, he serves as the Chief Executive Manager of Sunny Educational Consulting, located in Shorewood, Wisconsin. I used to live in Wisconsin myself. Dr. Obiakor, the distinguished professor of education, an author, a scholar with over 25 years of experience in the field of special education, inclusive education, and ed educational leadership with a particular emphasis on African-American and other culturally and lingu linguistically diverse learners. Dr. Obiakor has authored and co-authored over 200 publications, including books, book chapters, and articles on various educational topics. He has received numerous awards and recognitions for his outstanding contributions to education. Dr. Obiakor has presented more than 300 papers at national and international conferences and currently serves as the editor on the editorial boards of several reputable and uh, nationally and internationally refereed journals. Notably, he is the founding and executive editor of MLT, Multicultural Learning and Teaching. Again, everyone, we want to welcome a friend, a mentor, and just an all-around great person, Dr. Festus Obiakor. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Obiakor. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. All right. So we just have a few questions for you today. You can answer the questions in any way, shape, or form uh, that you feel. Um, but let's start with some of your recent work. You have a book called, uh, a book title right now. It's titled Reducing Hate Through Multicultural Education and Transformation. Reducing Hate. It is a very relevant, it's very relevant. Now, considering how hate has impacted the lives of far too many people, please discuss how you came up with the idea for this book. Thank you very much, Dr. Beecham and uh, Yalisa for inviting me to this podcast. Uh, Dr. Beecham, you know, I have so much love for you. And uh, I believe in you. And um, your university is lucky to have you here. Let's be frank. <laughs> well, uh, I got interested in writing the book, Reducing Hate Through Much Culture, Through Much Cultural Education and Transformation. Because as a young man in Nigeria, I grew up seeing hate. Nigeria was plunged in a, in a war, Nigeria Biafran war. And I saw babies being plucked from the wombs of mothers. People being blockaded. And many of the people, citizens dying of diseases and squalor, Kwashiorkor, a strange disease. And uh, the world, some parts of the world supported Biafra, some parts of the world supported Nigeria, but then the major, the major world power supported Nigeria. And uh, the Ibos, there was 
went out and organized program against Igbos, and I was one of those Igbos. The Biafra radio station happened to be located in my town. Mm. And as a result, planes were coming there every day and bombing the place. Mm. So as a young man, I saw hatred in practice, crime against humanity. And uh, the world was silent. So I told myself, as I grew up, I'm going to keep studying human beings. That's actually why I went to special education, because I just believe that we can do better than we've done as human beings. Yes, hate seems to be everywhere. But then love seems to be everywhere too. <laughs> but then people highlight like love. People don't play hate. Yet it's the poison that eats at love. So I thought, in politics, they've talked about hate. In sociology, they've talked about hate. In education, nobody talks about hate because there's a presumption of innocence that teachers are produced to teach. But one thing I know is that having the skills has nothing to do with the heart of mm. the individual who exhibits those skills. Until you show me you have a heart, I don't care about the skills that you have. Mm. I will not like you to be a teacher. That's why I decided to write this book. And if you look at what's going on in the world today, this book is highly needed. Look at the Middle East. Look at Russia, Ukraine. Look at the world. In Africa, there's war in every country in Africa. There's tribalism in the United States. We see the inner cities. Hate is almost, it's like an infectious disease. But then we kind of downplay it. We pretend it doesn't exist. Nobody's addressing solution. Everybody thinks, oh, if you sweep it under the rug, hate will disappear. Mm -hmm. Hate will never disappear until we will make it a part of our curriculum in education so that kids start from pre-K to university level to take courses, multicultural education, any course that we teach, we should let people know there's more to life than to hate. All right. Thank you very much. And, you know, um, spoiler alert, I ended up writing uh, writing the afterward in this uh, in this book. And one of the things I said in the afterward was uh, hate will always be with us because when you look in the mirror, hate and love are both within us. We have the ability to be. You can be a liberator. You can be an oppressor. You can build. You can destroy. You can cause you can create community. You can create chaos. All of that is within the human human being within is within our power. And in the book, the book showed me that, you know, yes, that's it. We got we got both sides, but it's a choice. Yes, I choose. <laughs> I make the choice if I'm going to act out in this world in a loving way or in a hateful way. Right. Yes. yes. Powerful, powerful lesson from the book. Powerful. Yeah. You know, I, I think uh, having Dr. Floyd do the afterword of the book was a. Uh, uh impressive was heartwarming because this is a guy who also has shown that love wins over hate all right yes, it does yes i'm just taking it all in <laughs> i'm just really listening intently because i often have the same thoughts I don't necessarily uh, speak them out loud, but I often, you know, as I'm listening to the radio, listening to the news, looking at what ha is happening in our country, politically, in our schools, um, you know, I often think about the same things. I've just never, you know, said them out loud. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm just taking everything in. So um, can you talk about how hate 
manifests itself in uh, K-12 and higher education? Thank you very much. That's a great question. That's actually why I wrote the book, because mm -hmm. that's a, an area I can control a little bit. <laughs> but as I educate people and mentor people, health is a part of life. Mm. And love is a part of life. But there's a presumption of innocence when it comes to, again, as I indicated, there's a presumption of innocence when it comes to educators and so on. And there's this assumption that if you're liberal, then you must never be hateful. Or if you're conservative, you must be hateful. No, not really. Those paradigms do not work in real life. You understand? That's why you'd not be surprised to see somebody who is extremely religious hate. Mm -hmm. See, one of the things we do not teach in education is that, yeah, we talk about individual differences in education. We talk about it. Yes, it's beautiful. And we should respect differences. It's beautiful. The problem is that even the most hateful person believes we're different. That's why he or she is hating you. <laughs> so what I suggest there is that we continue to think about the fact that Hate manifests itself when we value our own differences and do not value other people's differences. Or when we think that our differences are better than other people's differences. <laughs> so, if hate does not manifest itself, think about it. Why do we label students? Why do we have discretionary representation in gifted programs and in uh, behavior programs of students with behavioral disorders? If you go to schools, majority of the students in gifted programs are usually majority students, majority, majority white students, or rich students. Then if you go to the BD classes, majority of the students there are what? Minorities? disenfranchised students, vulnerable students who come from low SES, minority students who have linguistic differences, minority students who are racially different, or people who come who have a different national origin. Why do we continue to use instruments? We know that do not reflect the different cultures mm -hmm. of students, and we continue to use them. Mm -hmm. Research has proven that they don't work, but we continue to use them. <laughs> Why is it that we have school to, school to prison pipeline? Why do we invest the kind of money we invest in building prisons instead of funding education? Why is it difficult to even infuse culture of people in, cl in classes, what is the difficulty there? Why do we struggle with it? <laughs> that all these things do not show love at all. And if they don't show love, what do they show? They show hate. Because they do not demonstrate human valuing. So I believe that we have a lot to do in education. No more presumption of innocence for educators. It's like somebody firing you from a job and said, it's nothing personal. <laughs> the person forgets you have children, you have mm -hmm. a family. When you fire me from a job, it's something personal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to hate you, but it means that you don't care about me or my future. So in education, uh, I believe if we, it manifests itself based on the way we identify students, based on the way we assess students, based on the way we label students, based on the way we categorize students, based on the way we place students in different programs, based on the way we instruct students. Think about it. We're not afraid. We're not afraid to teach history based mm -hmm. on the way we instruct <laughs> students. 
When my kids came to, uh, when we moved down here, we went to the gifted program because the kids were ahead of the curve. And I told them I would like my daughter to be in a gifted program. And they, they, the director of the gifted program told me, we, we already have enough gifted students. <laughs> that sounds like a reasonable statement, but isn't that the most unreasonable statement in the world? <laughs> God came from heaven and said, no more gifted students here. <laughs> I said, give my daughter the opportunity. Then they struggled, they met and met and met and met and met and met. Then they said, okay, we can put her here, uh, you know, uh, tentatively. All the people in the gifted program in this suburb, we are all white students, no black. That my daughter right now is in her third year of residency at Yale University. She could not get into math or science. Her bachelor's degree was in neurological biology from the University of Wisconsin Madison. Master's degree was in medical physiology from the Medical School of Loyola in Chicago. Her medical degree was at Rush University. And now she's at Yale. She's in her third year of residency. My other daughter, I said, could you put her in a biology advance? The teacher told me bluntly, do you want us to lower our quality here? Mm -hmm. This is something we do in education. Think about the psychological impact on these kids. Then they, didn't, then they managed to put her in advanced biology. She now has a PhD in public health. Mm -hmm. Bachelor's degree from University of Wisconsin Madison in nutrition and health. M Master's degree at Tennessee State University in, in public health. Doctorate degree from Loyola, uh, uh, from, um, uh, from um, uh, Loma Linda University, sorry, mm -hmm. in, in California. So my question here is, what is our objective? Do we really want to help students to maximize their fullest potential? That would be the most loving thing to do. Or do we want to like stifle the growth of students by putting labels on them, not believing in them, not giving them the opportunity to be the best they can be? Think about the psychological impact of all of this. It's so Ever true. Yeah. I think about, um, you know, you're making me think about my my own children. Yes. And uh, my, my daughter, it was a similar experience. I wanted her to take dual enrollment courses. Um, so my study is in dual enrollment. And one of my motivations was my daughter's experiences. So I wanted her to take some dual enrollment courses before she graduated high school so she'd get a, a feel for, for college. And um, her uh, counselor basically said, no, you know, I don't think mm. that that's a good idea. She might not succeed. And I work in higher education. I've worked, you know, so, so mm -hmm. I had to go into the school and meet with the counselor. And then the counselor told me, you know, all these reasons why my daughter might not succeed in, in you know, taking college courses while still in high school. And then I had to tell her that I think I was a better gauge <laughs> mm -hmm. of, given that I worked in higher education, I was a better gauge of what she could do or not do in higher education. And then, so we agreed, she took courses and she got straight A's in all of them. And she graduated this mm -hmm. past year with a biochem degree. And so, um, and she's done research in, you know, in four different uh, universities. Um, in different areas. And so, but I often think about those students that don't have parents like, like us who can manage the system yep. and, and how, how do they deal with, with the, the hate or lack of love, lack of care, lack of access. Um, and so, so 
that's who I think about often. Like I, you know, I can go and battle my kids, you know, I can, I can, you know, arm myself with knowledge mm-hmm. because that's our background, right? That's what we know. Um, but what about the kids that don't and how, you know, as you're saying, how do we as educators learn to love beyond those labels? Right. So, yes. yeah. So I, um, it, you're just making me think a lot. So I don't know <laughs> if I have a question, but it was just more of like, you know, it's so true. You know, how can we love and think the best and expect the best and, and help students tr- strive towards the best instead of just creating um, roadblocks that they may be able to surpass or not surpass? Yeah. Well, I think we're talking about public school. Then at the university level, hmm. that's where another crisis comes. Why is it that somebody who graduated with another person, a white student and a black student, they both graduated from a major university, a research one university. When we get a job, boom, in another research one university, then the black one will be looking for a job, sometimes driving a cab. Hmm. <laughs> So are universities doing what they're supposed to do? Are they good examples of espousing love? And you know, the problem here is that when you talk about love or hate, these are all (laughs) words. But in our actions, Mm -hmm. What have we done? You see a department with no African-American faculty in the United States? Come on. (laughs) Come on. And when you talk about people, we talk about quality. Quality education. Quality without a heart is like a house without a roof. So we need to get into understanding that quality means, and you see some programs that say, oh, they're highly rated. I will fail all those programs immediately if they don't have minority students or students from other cultures. Because they're not high quality programs. If they're high quality, they should attract all people of all kinds. If not, they are hateful programs. Mm -hmm. Quality has nothing to do with love or hate. But how we practice that quality is where the hate comes in. I was colonized by England, Nigeria. When I came for graduate school, They told everybody who came from Nigeria to take remedial English. Mm. What saved me was that I was an English teacher. (laughs) (laughs) So they they said, so I told them, what do you want me to do? (laughs) In my PhD program also, they require people to take English. And some students were upset that they made them take remedial English. They didn't make me take remedial English. So my advisor had to carry my master's thesis from TCU, Texas Christian University, and show it to the class, to my classmates and told them, he wrote that, they look at it. Are you sure he wrote that? (laughs) Isn't that funny? (laughs) So that's why you see me writing a lot because we need my, we need different voices in the field. Sometimes we write these books for ourselves and they don't make sense. Mm -hmm. No implications for education. Look at research journals. We started in the field of special education. If any publication does not talk, that does not have implications for practice, it should not be published. It's okay to put all kinds of data by the way, statistical, statistical significance does not mean importance. 
it has to make sense to everybody. We have to be able to interpret our results. We have to use our result to inform practice and service. If not, we're scorching the snake, but not killing it. Mm -hmm. I believe that K through, th K through 12 can do miracles. Mm. It, it could actually end hate by saying, we're not going to condone it here. For you to work so hard to work on a master's degree or come for a PhD, you're already smart in our opinion. We're just going to make sure you have an environment for you to be the best you can be. How is that? <laughs> People will tell you, oh, it's trying to lower quality. I wonder when wickedness has become quality. Quality is a beautiful thing. But I, I believe in quality with a heart. Mm -hmm. Teaching with a smile. Competence with a heart. Let me use marriage as an example. I married a Jamaican. We're not, we've not been living together for 40 years because of quality. <laughs> We're living for 40 years because of heart, 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 love. It doesn't mean we don't quarrel. <laughs> In fact, it's a part of that love because when we quarrel, I understand where she's coming from. People go, no, you don't want to argue because you don't want. No, you cannot fake life. And you cannot fake love. And more so, you cannot fake hate. <laughs> so every behavior we engage in is measurable because they can be observed. They happen to human beings, fellow human beings. I believe it's easy to make the world a better place if we all can value our own humanities. Hate has failed us. And hate will continue to fail us until we come to the realization that we have to work together collaboratively, consultatively, cooperatively, what I call the three C's to make the world a better place. I wrote this book to make the world a better place. Because we've been faking it a lot. If you continue to sweep your problems under the rug, one day it's going to explode. So I hope this book reminds us, or this podcast reminds us, that we can shift our paradigm to want to make a change in this world. And if we want to make a change, we have to be the change that we want from the world. Dr. Obiakor, you just you just brought up the you brought it back around to the book. I'm so I'm so glad you did because um, who is the audience for this book? In other words, who needs to read this book? It's interesting because I said all human beings, <laughs> all human beings. <laughs> if we can start this book, the book. From first grade, pre-kindergarten, if needs, if need be, mm. pre-kindergarten to the highest level. Mm -hmm. Doc, you're gonna have to write a you're gonna have to write a children's book, the children's version. Well, you know, uh oh, I, uh -oh. I, think, uh, <laughs> I, I think it's a good thing, but maybe they will use my book to start learning how to read. How is that? <laughs> you know, I think the book is for everyone, but then. As human beings, as educators, shouldn't we be the leaders? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't we be the good role models? The time we spend trying to concoct how not to do the right thing is time not spent doing the wrong, is time not spent doing the right thing. 
loving is the easiest thing to do in life. But hating is easier <laughs> than loving. Mm. Because when you hate, you join the herd mentality. How many of you have had friends who they never see anything good in anybody? Even when they try so hard, they go, oh, John is a good person, uh, but, but there's always a but. <laughs> Nobody is perfect. Only God is perfect in my book. For those who believe in Christianity, only God is perfect. Or oh, Allah, for Muslims, for Jewish people, God is perfect in my book. If you're an atheist, whatever you think is perfect is perfect. But that perfection deals towards valuing humanity. When you look at somebody who's never done anything to you and you hate them, you are not valuing humanity. So this book is for leaders, teachers, parents, students at all levels. And this book is especially good for t politicians who are banning books today. <laughs> and we're laughing about it. Mm -hmm. We are stooping so low. Where are we going? I pray for all of us every day. I think we need to we need to regroup, get ourselves together, and see what we can do collectively to build a what a, a better world for all of us. Thank you so we, much. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So you're, you've written over 200 published articles, books, and um, so you're one of education's most prolific authors. Um, can you talk about the mindset that you have? you have to have to produce at that level. Like I went, you know, when I was looking at your bio, I was like, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> how? So how, uh, what kind of mindset do you have to have to, to be able to write, you know, that often at that level? Thank you very much. Isn't it amazing that my father and mother did not finish second grade? Mm. They were just traders. I think um, I talked about collaboration. I talked about consultation. I talked about cooperation a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. You have to have that mindset. Remember now, we are living in this world. How would you like to, how would you like posterity to remember you? I've always thought about it. As somebody who experienced early trauma of hate, I've always tried to do, think about what can I do to allow posterity to remember me? And I thought, instead of the rhetoric of critiquing people's work and go, oh, that's just, I've had that before. Put it in writing, especially mm -hmm. for many minorities whose histories are being deflated if you do not, I have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. If I do not tell my story, who do you think can tell my story? I remember in those days, as a PhD student, I, I asked my advisor, I said, I wanted to do a study, trying to check, trying to uh, get into the perceptions of foreign born, foreign students on campus. Please, Simple, quick research. I said, I didn't see so much on it. My advisor looked at me and laughed. He said, who needs this? Who needs information you're researching anyway? That's when I knew, oh my God, I need this information. Mm -hmm. So I can see how I can adjust myself. So I've not stopped writing. 
I had a mentor who told me, I told, I asked him, how can you succeed in higher education? His name is Dr. John Obu, the popular Dr. John Obu. And that mentor of mine was Dr. Esa Hilliard. I asked him, how do you get to be known in the field? They said, you need your voice to be out. Then I asked them, how do you want your voice to be out? They said, there are three rules. I said, what are the three rules? They said, rule number one, right. I said, what's the second rule? Rule number two, right. I said, what's the third rule? They said, rule number three, right. I said, OK. <laughs> <laughs> but then what I found out as a scholar is this. To be a good scholar, you have to believe in learning. You have to believe in reading. You have to believe in thinking. You have to believe in writing. You have to believe in teaching. But you also have to believe in creating. And you have to believe in leading. If you have these qualities, you'll be a great scholar. You might not write 90 something books like maybe Dr. Biako. <laughs> but uh, uh, your voice will be out there. What we really need is our voices to be out there. All of us here have unique voices. We have unique stories to tell. And if we can tell our stories, we'll be surprised that your story is similar to mine. Doesn't that automatically get us to get along because we're telling the same stories? So how do we deal with our imperfections? If we don't make the effort. So publish at this level, you have to follow all these qualities. I wanted to be a leader in the field. And I got to be. I wanted to be somebody who is well known in the field. I got to be. I wrote a book a few years ago. It's published by the Council for Exceptional Children. If you can lay hands on it, that would be good. The title of the book is Publish, Flourish, and Make a Difference. Mm -hmm. When you're a scholar, you're making a difference. You know, it's funny because when you write books, it has a catechetical influence on your life. Because you know you're doing the right thing. Because when I write, I read the Bible, I read Shakespeare, mm -hmm. I read everything, I infuse all of this in my work. I want to see like minds. And I want to see different minds. Differences are beautiful to me because they are the wonders of our own individualities. One voice is boring. <laughs> Multiple voices are beautiful. Doc is well stated, well stated. And and he's he he, we didn't ask him this question. But I'm going to throw this in for free. Uh, Dr. Obiakor is also a great mentor of students, of uh, scholars, uh, administrators, uh, deans and presidents, you know, and a lot of different people seek his counsel. Um, and for for me, um, I worked down the hallway from him at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee years ago, and we just casually knew one another. And one day, by chance. By chance, I was getting on the elevator um, and Dr. Obiakor's office was strategically positioned where he can see anybody and everybody coming in and off the elevator. And all he had to do was lean the seat back a little bit and he could see you. And he saw me and said, hey, hey, Phil, come here, come here. Um, and I thought nothing of it because uh, I was about to get on the elevator. I said, you know, I'm going to go see what uh, Dr. O was, Dr. O was talking about. And he said, come on, come here, come sit down. And he had the most frank conversation with me. And he basically said, he basically said, what are you doing with your time? <laughs> what are you doing with your time? Are you writing? If you don't write, you're going to get fired. 
And it's not, and don't blame, don't look around and blame anybody else around here because it's not their fault. It's your, it'll be your fault because I'm telling you right now, <laughs> you have the information. You can make a decision right now. And from that moment on, I said, you know what? He's right. And I made a decision to be more productive, a lot more productive, to shift my mindset over to the to what he's talking about and say, you know what? I got to write. I got to get my teaching down pat. I got to do my service, you know, but I got to put it at the forefront because the clock is ticking and it doesn't stop. <laughs> the clock does not stop. So I wanted to, uh, I wanted to tell that story because that's what I needed to hear. The truth. And as your listener and your listener can also say it, you know, I'm a, I try to be nice most of the time, but if there's some moments where I got to tell you the truth, so if you're a doctoral student and you're not writing, I'll say, I'm going to tell you, you got to write. You got to graduate. The clock is ticking. <laughs> There's no way around it. We all got a job to do and you got to do your job. All of us. I can, you know, you got to write, you got to write, you got to get through the program. You know, I, we got to mentor you, you know, and get you to go off and do great things. But it, 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 it has, everybody has to do their job. And for those who are watching this right now or you're listening to this right now, you can see three different groups, three different generations of how we're all connected through the work from Dr. Yobuya Akor to myself, to Yulitsa and whoever Yulitsa, Yulitsa will go on to, to influence, right? And this in this way, we keep the mindset going, the lessons learned from Dr. Yobuya Akor's mentors. I learned from his mentors <laughs> through him. And in this, they're my ancestors. <laughs> they become my ancestors. And we create the family tree of, of academic scholarship. And we go on to all value the voices is the way I see it. I was thinking the same thing. I, uh, you know, as, as Dr. Obiakor is speaking and sharing his experience and then you shared your experience. And then I'm thinking about my own experience of getting mentored by you, Dr. Beecham you know, and how you've really uh, supported me in, in, in writing and getting published and presenting at conferences. Uh, you know, I never imagined I'd be doing some of the things that I'm doing. And I mean it in a, in a, mm -hmm. a positive way. Like it wasn't even a, a reality for me until I had you as my mentor. And so I feel like it's almost like a paying it forward. We don't pay mm -hmm. it back. We just keep paying it forward. So when I, you know, finish the program and go to work with students, I'll be taking that. So I'll be taking both of your lessons, you know, all lessons that you, Dr. Beecham, learned from Dr. Obiakor and I learned from you. And then I'll be I'll be paying that forward to my future students. So it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. I think uh, everything you've all said, everything you've all said, make sense. Because, um, you know, it's each one, each one. That's why this idea about love is so critical. It's measurable. It's measurable. I hate it's also measurable. Just as we're talking about how do we magnify love in a productive way, measurable way, hate can also be magnified in measurable ways. It's a choice we have to make. Mm -hmm. And what hurts is when the people who are supposed to lead <laughs> are not leading with love, they're leading with hate. We keep dancing around the edges, and our society is almost going down the drain. I think all of us need to exhale, regroup, recalibrate, and go back to why we are supposed to do what we are doing. I'm doing what I'm doing because I want to make the world a better place. I did not want Dr. Beechin to fail because I've seen many people come in and go. 
revolving door. And these institutions don't mind doing it. They will hire one, they go, we have one black, we have two blacks, we have three black. You know, it's almost like apples and oranges. You have you need to go and seek for quality faculty. But we use the word fitting in. Fitting in in what? If your house is already clean, somebody coming into your house will respect the cleanliness and join you in being clean, right? <laughs> you don't need somebody to fit in anymore. It joins you in your cleanliness because you have a good environment that is not hate-filled. Have you discovered in a hate-filled environment there are cliques mm -hmm. here and there? Production is not even done. We have to be careful as a society in our institutions. Think about what's going on in the Congress. Think about what's going on in our schools. Think about what's going on in our universities. Think about what's going on in our environments. Think about what's going on in our communities. You will see that we lost some steps because somewhere in our minds, we've looked at love as a fluffy idea. Mm -hmm. And when people are hateful, we go, it's just a difference in personality. We use all kinds of statements to, to, to masquerade the reality of saying, you are very hateful, you might wanna sh shift your paradigm. So, we need to welcome parents in schools. But we also need to know that some of the parents also come with hate. We need to get parents to understand that this is an environment, the school is an environment that should help an individual to maximize his or her fullest potential. A school should be a place where people should be given opportunity to grow and be better human beings. After all, why are we doing what we're doing? Isn't it to make the world a better place? Mm -hmm. So that's why this book is so critical. Um, I'm going to get into the banning of books because it's almost like in Vogue is the most disingenuous and disgraceful habit that I see today. Mm -hmm. If a book is really for adults, why not go to the library somewhere and say, only for adults. <laughs> so adults will come there and read it. Have sections in the library where people can just go there and read whatever they feel like reading. But to ban a book, you're banning a history, you're banning a story, you're banning life. And uh, I think we moralize a lot and we rationalize a lot. But this book tells us we can be moral. But we can still love. What I'm concluding in this book is that love goes with moral compass. Hate does not reflect good moral compass because it's very infectious. It's dangerous. <laughs> it leads to wars. People die in wars. Generations are lost. Businesses don't even like to locate in environments that are hateful. How can schools flourish in environments that are hateful? 
So I think uh, it's critical that we all get copies of this book, Reducing Love Through Much Cultural Education and Transformation. Getting educated much culturally is not enough for me anymore. Mm. I've seen some multicultural gurus who are hateful. <laughs> when I was a, a student in graduate school, David Duke came to my school. People would ask me, why are you going? You don't have to go. Oh my God, don't go. I went. After he spoke, I, I, I asked a question. David Duke he said, yeah. Where are you from? I said, Nigeria originally. I said, David Duke, you're working on your bachelor's degree now? He said, yes. But I'm working on my PhD. Why, why do you think I'm not smarter than you? He said, that's a good question. He looked at me. He did not answer that question. If I did not go, <laughs> I wouldn't have known. I would have assumed. Let's stop assumptions, presumptions, perceptions. They are very deceptive. Try to know people before you make judgments about them because we can't stop people from judging. Judgment comes from God feelings. Remember now, let's assume, and we're not saying when we talk about love and hate, we're not saying that if a student is so disruptive in school, you leave them in school. No, you should expel them if they need to be expelled. <laughs> but expel them with love. Don't get the police to arrest them and send them to jail. There's so many things we can do as a society to remediate hate. Um, when you are around and you talk amongst yourself, people who think like you, people who look like you, ask yourself always, what will somebody else who does not look like me think? What if somebody does not think like me think? What, what, you know, are we okay? This doesn't look like our community. Let's hear the perspective of the other people. But when we know, we come together, we collaborate. We consult, we cooperate. These are traces of love and not hate. But when you're collaborating with somebody who looks like you, thinks like you, you're not collaborating yet. That is what you call fraudulent mm -hmm. multiculturalism. Thank God I did not marry who thinks like me. <laughs> because maybe, who knows? <laughs> I'd be somewhere there. Maybe not alive. <laughs> because without my wife, I wouldn't be where I am. She helps to tame me. <laughs> so, uh, you want to agree with people who think alike? But always think, what does somebody who does not think alike think about this situation? When it's too good to be true, it is false. <laughs> That's why we cannot go with herd mentality. We have to analyze situations. Knowledge is not enough anymore. Comprehension is not even enough anymore. We have to look at what is applicable, what we can analyze, what we can synthesize, what we can evaluate. 
if we can't measure it, yes, you can measure the heart. But you can see how the heart works based on the actions of the individual. It's actually in the Bible. What the heart is thinking is what comes out of the mouth. So I think um, we all need to think about how do we enhance love, life, reduce hate, wars, tribalism, and all kinds of misconceptions happening today. My students, I say, Professor, they will go, you different from how they said about you. Even before my students come to my class, they've already told the students who I am, <laughs> forgetting that every class has its own chemistry. I'm forgetting that the teacher sometimes is in a good mood. The teacher is not good. Sometimes in a good mood, sometimes in a bad mood. I think we're not, we're very puritanical in our reasoning. We need to start understanding we are human beings with human differences, with human weaknesses. When we make mistakes, I don't believe in firing somebody because they've made a racist statement. I believe in re-educating that individual. Because if you fire him, he goes to somewhere else or she goes to somewhere else and continues to behave that way and blames the people who caused it. They never get redeemed. That's why I say from preschool to university level, we have to shift our paradigm, organize programs in universities, like our teacher training programs, if you look at it, people are saying, oh, you can't teach about DEI anymore. What? You can't talk about much culturalism anymore. People are scared. How can I deny my culture? It's not denying my life. By the way, it's boring. <laughs> 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 Doc, and I'm I'm so glad you um uh, you spoke on the um on the book banning situation and you know we don't have to take too long on this but do you think that uh when we're seeing this book banning we're seeing the elimination of DEI programs we're seeing a lot of this and in, in your mind does this does this come from a place of hate and ignorant hate or ignorance or hate and ignorance? Well. Have you discovered that people are excited about what turns them on? Mm -hmm. They're excited. Mm -hmm. And what turns them on is what they like, right? Mm -hmm. And what they love, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. The same thing with hate. Mm -hmm. The same thing with hate. So it, it comes from a hateful place. It comes from a close-minded place. It comes from an insensitive place. The most dangerous statement I've heard in this ban in the books is somebody had, some people are debating slavery helped to enrich black people. How crazy does that sound? <laughs> How crazy does that sound? Mm -hmm. The hate there is loaded that your victimization, I, I know that suffering brings character, but oh my God. Your, your slavery, inhumanity makes you strong. I think the people I blame in this are the, uh, the minorities. We need to start telling our stories. One of the things I love about Jewish people is that they don't forget their stories. Can you go to a Jewish person and say, the Holocaust made you stronger? That's an abomination. You can't do that. Sometimes suffering doesn't breed character. Mm -hmm. 
Suffering destroys generation. Suffering destroys character. Slavery. Colonialism. They've not given me any strength. They try to destroy me, but I'm trying to rewrite it. That's why we're writing some of the things we're writing to make sure we tell our stories the right way. That's why I urge every culturally and every cultural and linguistically diverse person to start doing some writing. Start telling your story. Thank you so much. Um, you're motivating me, right? <laughs> like, okay, I gotta get going. Um, I, you are. Uh, you know, usually for me, writing is like. I feel like I'm I'm giving birth every time I write because it's <laughs> it's not an easy thing for me. Yeah. Um, but you know, I never looked at it that way. I I never looked at it, you know, as as um as sharing my my, you know, my story and sharing and putting that, you know, out into you know into being. And, and the possibilities that others might be able to see themselves through that. Um, uh, so thank you. I, you're, you're definitely inspiring me to, to go home and, and to write and, and hopefully maybe get through my dissertation too, but definitely to, I, I think what you're giving me is probably, um, I want to say the word brave, to be brave, you know, because I, um, I think, I have a lot of things that go through my head, but I don't necessarily say them out loud or write them. They just kind of work their way there. And yeah. um, and so I think that um, what you're calling for is almost like being brave, you know, because it's important, you know? Um, so so thank you so much. I, I appreciate yeah. what you're saying and I appreciate, uh, you know, how, how your you know your perspective how you're presenting love and and hate and how we can and start transforming that and things we should consider which you know some of the questions that you pose i i haven't thought about and i haven't you know and, and so um i'm really gaining a lot from what you're saying and it's motivating me to be braver in my mm -hmm. writing so i appreciate mm -hmm. it thank you so very much um thank you, thank you. nobody's a born writer Mm -hmm. I don't know. Nobody said, all right. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> no, I don't struggle with it. And sometimes when I start writing something, sheets of papers around bundles of them I, I, I become trash because mm -hmm. I'm trying to find that idea. You know, when I'm coming up with a title for a book, oh, I come up, I go through many of them until I arrive at what, what I really want. It's a question of dedication. Just take it as telling your own story. You're telling your story. You see, many people spend time looking at your work and go, I just saw a spelling mistake here. I just saw this. Good. It's okay. <laughs> but this is my story. If you don't like it, go tell your own story. <laughs> So if we can look at life like that, I think we'll be okay. And they don't be afraid to write. Don't be afraid to tell your story. But when you tell your story, tell it in such a way that the person you're telling the story could learn from your story. Don't write something aversive. Don't just write and go, you know, because without white people, I wouldn't be where I am today. That's my story. Without my mentors, some of them white, some of them black, some of them Latinos, some of them Asians, some of them Native Americans, without, without their efforts, I might not be where I am today. Think about it. I married a, a Jamaican. We met in college. We have four kids. You see, the story continues to go. Mm. And that's the way life is. What frustrates me is that when you talk about quality, people mean people think quality means being brutal. No. The good, the best kind of quality is quality that believes in quality with a heart. 
Whatever you're doing, add some soul and heart to it. Mm. So I have a question for you. Um, so what um, what is your most recent project? So are you working on something new? <laughs> yes, I have, a book that, <laughs> I have a book that is in press right now. The title of the book is Special Education, Advancing Values. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit in about that, that book? In that book, I think your name is in that book. Oh, <laughs> yeah, Dr. Bitchin. I think oh. I think you have a chapter in it. Yep. Yes. You, you see, what we're trying, what I'm saying there is, I went back. It's like this book I just wrote. I went back to values. Mm -hmm. You see, if people can respect the values of humanity. Maybe we won't need laws and all these things. If we can look at life as imperfection, that is heading toward perfection, that does not really exist, we'll be okay. So I'm arguing, we have all these special education laws, and these laws stipulate the values that we must respect in special education, like due process, parental involvement, non-discriminatory assessment. Least restrictive environment. Least restrictive environment. <laughs> yeah. I individualized education program. Mm -hmm. All these things, some of the values that are engraved in special education. Why are we not practicing these values? Many of us now look at special education as a place to place students. We are using special education to disenfranchise students now. Special education now, does, we've forgotten that it's remediation. We've used special education as now label. That's why you say teachers will go, I'm a gifted teacher. Then people will look at that teacher as great, right? Well, I'm a special education teacher. Oh, <laughs> you teach those people? But what that person doesn't know is that gifted students also experience trauma. They're also special kids. In fact, all of us are special. <laughs> there are some things I know how to do there are some things I don't know how to do I cannot change the oil in my car <laughs> there, I have friends doctors, lawyers they can change their oil in their car that they can change the oil in their car doesn't mean that they're smarter than me it's just that I, I don't know how to change oil in my car <laughs> And there are some things I know how to do that they cannot do. That doesn't make them retarded. But in special education, we now look at it. So we're always passing new laws, trying to make sure everything is okay, because somebody is bound to mess up the values. <laughs> so I'm saying, how do we maintain these values and maintain these values? sustain and advance our values. Why do we continue to compromise our own values? We talked about non-discriminatory assessment. All of a sudden, they passed a law, every student, whether you have problem or not, you take the same exam. And people say, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you don't know why we pass the policy. Some of these policies, I don't know the reason. Especially every field has its own values. I urge us to respect the values of our respective fields and look for ways to advance those values. That's why I did the book. Mm. And the publisher is Emirat Publishing. Mm -hmm. It's coming out in few in, in, a, in a few months. For Emirat, I do only special education texts. I've done about 40 textbooks with them. Mm. All we do there is special ed. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just think that if we respect values, again, we have the Civil Rights Act of 1964, right? We've gone through Brown Board mm -hmm. of Education. But now we have a Supreme Court that is destroying precedents. Where are we going? Are we moving forward or are we moving back? I pray that we respect our precedents, our values, and look for ways to beautify those values. 
so that those values will respond to 21st century values. What are 21st century values? Demographic changes, technological advancements, right? More literate parents, funding, increasing funding, taking care of the disadvantaged, disenfranchised, and the solutions. Mm -hmm. So that we don't demean them. I think if we respect our values in education, we won't be writing a book like Reducing Hate Through Multicultural Education and Transformation. Books like that will be obsolete. <laughs> so I'm glad that people are crazy, acting crazy, so that I can write those books. <laughs> <laughs> However, I will like I will rather not write those books so that all of us will respect humanity. My students get surprised when I tell them, I'm not more important than you. And they look at me like, really? But I'm not. I'm their professor right now. Tomorrow, who knows what they will be? Yes. <laughs> I produce generals in the army. I produce somebody who ran for Senate. I produce college presidents, provosts. They've now done better than me. And it's a beautiful thing. That's how we advance our values. My mentee is an endowed chair at Lehigh University. You can't beat that. I'm happier than him most of the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still working. <laughs> you know? So I think um, we need to advance our values without destroying our values. We have to sustain our values, maintain our values, and advance our values. We are not iconoclasts. We are people who believe in advancing our world, advancing our humanity. And we need to start thinking how we possess to remember us if we know more in this on this earth. So I'm just adding my own voice to uplift humanity. That's why I do the works I do. Doc, thank you for that explanation of the. I know we we wrote a chapter for your book, uh, and I read your uh, your original proposal, but that's probably a much deeper explanation of of really what's behind the title. And you talked about it a little bit earlier that when you when you think about the title of the book, you you pull from these different sources. You really think about it, and that just gave me some you know just a little more lesson, another lesson on you know you just don't slap a title on the book. You know the title means something. Yes. And, and and you listen, you know where I'm going with this because I'm going to say the title for your dissertation. We're just not going to slap a title on there. It's <laughs> going to we're going to look at you. You know, we're going to look at the elements. We're going to look at your variables, and you know, <laughs> your title is, go is going to mean something, right? Because you're, you're going to you're going to be communicating a message. So on every piece of work we do, just like the titles we we write for Dr. Obiakbor, every title we put on there, you know, we're we're sending a message. You know, there's a deeper message, and some of that message is is to send a part of the message is, is telling the world what it's about and another part of the message is to attract people yes. to want to read yes what it is they want you you want to pull people to your content you know and if they and for people who are short on time then they're just looking at the title and and what i've learned from dr obiakor is you know you can grab attention over with that book title with that article title with that chapter title and bring people in and then they'll know then they can read your story but sometimes you got to bring them in, you know, into community. Right? I, think, I think more than seven of my books have been reviewed by Teachers College Records. Mm -hmm. That's not easy. Mm -hmm. So because we try to do good work, they might not sell millions of dollars because they're not very controversial. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy that my books are not on the bookshelves somewhere with dust all over them. <laughs> you know, that uh, Teachers College Records found these books interesting and fascinating to review. Uh, Dr. Beecham, 
your books have also been reviewed by Teachers College yep. uh, Records. Yep. It, the recent one, <laughs> I wrote the foreword for that one. Yep. Yep. And uh, <laughs> it was reviewed by Teachers College Records. So if we do good work, we need to understand that we're maintaining values and advancing values, and we're leaving something for posterity to remember us. Mm -hmm. Yep. Doc, I know we're uh you know we're 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 running short on time and we got we got we got one more question for you. We got one more question. Uh and I'm going to I'm going to put um for those of you who are attending AERA American uh Educational uh Research Association the annual meeting is going to be in Philadelphia 2024. It's going to be in Philadelphia 2024 one of the largest gatherings of higher education uh researchers in the nation. An international conference is going to be in Philadelphia Pennsylvania. If you go to AERA, be sure to go into that large hall, the exhibit hall, where they have all the books. All the publishers are there. And as you look through those books, you're going to see several books by Dr. Festus Obiakor. So even if he's not at AERA, his presence is felt all over. And you go from one publisher, whether you're talking about Peter Lang or you're talking about Sage or um, Information Age, you know, as you go through the various ones, you'll see his work reflected um, and his impact on the field. So as he talks about this idea of, of posterity and leaving a legacy, because some of this, I mean, in these ways in which uh, some of our works will far outlive a lot of us and for successive generations, we'll know what we're thinking right now and maybe we can inform the future, not just the present, but through the writing through, our, through communicating our thoughts in the written form, we can possibly potentially impact people that we'll never meet, but they will know us through the writing. And that's a beautiful thing. Dr. Obiakor, any final, final thoughts for our audience? Well, um, I, I want to thank you, Dr. Beecham, and uh, your graduate assistant, Dr. Uh, Yalisa Hudson, to be doctor, <laughs> uh, uh, for inviting me here. Um, the only thing I want to say, the final thought is that I believe we can make a difference in the world if we choose to. Mm. The world is like a home where you have family members coming and going. Some of them you like more, some of them you don't like. <laughs> but even when you don't like them, please do not hate them. Because when you hate them, you're driving them away from your home. So always think about how to make a difference in the world you live in and how to make a difference in other people's lives. I think if you think that, whether you're a teacher, a scholar, a leader, or a professional, or a politician, you got to be thinking about how do we make the world a better place? Thank you again for the invitation. All right. There it is, folks. You heard it. Dr. Festus Obiakor, I want to thank our guests once more, once more, Dr. Festus Obiakor, Yalitza, thank you for thank all you. of your hard work in, uh, in putting you, this both. together. I want to thank um, the audience, our viewers. I want to also thank our listeners out there. If you're listening to this uh, podcast form, uh, we want to thank you. Uh, I'll say a little word about the evolution of this show, Once Upon a Time. This show started years ago. Um, in a studio right here uh, on the lower campus of Lehigh University. Um, it started, and you only could get this on YouTube. Now, you might be listening to this in one of the different forms. This podcast is now available on platforms such as Amazon, such as um, Google, such as, I'm missing, I'm missing one, Yalitza. Uh, Apple. There we go. Apple. Um, and still on, I think we're still on YouTube, right? Yes. And also on YouTube, multiple platforms, because, again, the, the purpose is to get our message out there 
um, to broader audiences. And a lot of this, I'll give credit to Ulyssa because when she came and joined the team, um, she really put forward the plan to help um, put us in this lane where we can reach more and more individuals. All right, folks. So with that, that brings us to the close of our show. Uh, what a what a great time. I hope you liked it. I hope you listened. I hope you learned. Next time, our next guest will be up. Uh, that's a surprise. <laughs> but the show will be meaningful. It will be impactful. It will be exciting. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to join us again next time. Dr. Obiakor, as always, my brother, thank you for your mentorship. Thank you for everything you've done to, to push my career, uh, to help my career. And thank you for all you've done for my students, because they all know you and appreciate everything you've done for them. <laughs> thank you. God bless all of you. Take care. All right. Thank you very much. All bye right. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs>